Thank you guys for leading us in worship this morning. Beautiful. Boy, Facebook does a lot of stuff. It even makes people aware when you're having a garage sale. It's like there's no privacy. I want to have a garage sale by my... No, I'm teasing. Thank you for praying for us. You know, I, I was struck this morning as I was coming in here. I thought, I have never been asked so, by so many people anywhere, much less my church family, how my garage sale went. And that's just cool. They, y'all care about my garage sale. It went great. I got to tell you, though, if you're going to put a tarp up, you better think about water flow, okay? Because it doesn't just, it, it comes off somewhere, okay? So you think about that before you put the tarp up, Jeremiah, just telling you, okay? I know that probably wouldn't cross your mind. It didn't cross mine until it was, <laughs> had, a, had a waterfall <laughs> coming into my garage instead of away. That was kind of funny. I was getting ready to move last week, and we were going through a lot of, you know, when we moved from Winslow Court to where we are now, I kept carrying out boxes that said sentimental. I mean, I thought, these must not be very sentimental. Because I hadn't seen them in 20 years. So I decided before I moved again, I'm going through all that stuff. I was going through a box of high school sentimental stuff. You wouldn't believe the junk I kept. I kept my mouthpiece, a 20-year-old mouthpiece. It was (laughs) ragged out when I got done with football season. I mean, I don't know why I kept it. I had a hip pad. From football, I kept everything they'd let me keep, I guess. I had two chin straps. I apparently stole somebody else's just to keep it. But I was going through all that stuff. It really was sentimental, uh, but I, I don't need to keep the junk, and so I threw a lot of it away. But I was thinking about football, and I don't know how many of y'all have seen Napoleon Dynamite. I probably shouldn't recommend the movie, but <laughs> it is, it's the dumbest movie ever created. <laughs> probably why it appeals to me at some level, but there's a, there's a guy in there that's stuck. 20 years later, in his high school glory days, thinking, man, he should have, should have won state kind of thing. And I, I was l- thinking back, doing my best not to get to where Uncle, whatever his name was, <laughs> Uncle Rico. And, but anyway, I was thinking about how much I hated football practice and how much I loved football games. I mean, I was thinking, I just, I remember sitting out on football practice, you, this won't surprise you a bit, but I would count how many doves would fly over. I mean, I was practicing, but I was wishing I was hunting. I was, but I, come Friday night, I just, I was, I loved Friday night. And one thing, I had some great coaches and some really good coaches, but one thing they didn't do well enough, maybe it was me, I'm going to blame it on my coaches, but they didn't connect the practice and the sacrifice and the blood, sweat, and tears type thing close enough with what happened on Friday night. And you, you assume that you make that connection, but 17, 18 year old guys don't make that connection. They just think you're trying to kill me out here and then I just wish I could go play football on Friday night. And I really never made the connection and it made practice grueling and hard and and not nearly as fulfilling as it needed to be for me. High school football, as fun as it was, it's not that big a deal in life. I understand that. If I didn't understand that, I certainly understood it after I watched Napoleon Dynamite and saw Uncle Rico. But what I'm thinking about today is, is how that lesson that I realized about, about understanding the ultimate purpose of football practice applies to my life today. That is, if I would have connected the purpose of practice to the pleasure of Friday night, it would have rearranged how I saw everything on those Monday through Thursday practices. And I think a lot of us go through life day after day never really thinking about the purpose of life. And I don't know that we should you know, day after day, think about, well, my life purpose is. But I, I don't know that we are aware enough of why we exist. What's the meaning of our lives? What's the purpose of living on this planet? I, I don't think there are a lot of us who live with a com- clear, compelling understanding of that. But understanding our purpose changes our entire perspective on life in an amazing way. When you get hold of why you're on the planet... When that becomes clear all of a sudden, when you connect day-to-day life with your purpose, everything begins to change. Everything begins to look different. And, and it's, so let's look to God's Word. If God, if God is the author of life, right? If He's the one who gave us life, then He should have the answer to the purpose of life. So let's go to His Word today in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 34 through 40 is where we're going to read. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 22. 
Look down in verse 34, and we're going to read verses 34 through 40. I've preached out of this many times. Most preachers have. It's typically called the passage of the greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. If you'd stand today just in the honor of reading God's Word together, we're going to recognize this as God's Word and not the newspaper today, all right? So let's, let's read that. You follow along, I'll read it out loud. In the New American Standard Bible, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, asked Jesus a question, testing him. Verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? He's asking him, what's the biggest, the greatest, the most important commandment of all the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind, this is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That's the whole Old Testament. Everything that they knew at that point depended upon that teaching right there. Pray with me. Father, this is your word. We're not looking to ink and paper. We're looking to the message, to the living, breathing, life-changing Word of God. And I'm asking you to take it now and, and, and just speak to us in a way that we don't just hear it, but that we obey it. Desperately, Father, we need to obey the Word of God. Live it out. Go do it. So help us today. We need your Spirit to do that. Communicate to us in a way that we can understand. We, we want to honor you right now. We don't want to just listen to things about you. We want to listen to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That passage seems to be pretty straightforward, right? I mean, there's not a lot of ambiguity. It's not take long to study or figure it out what it's talking about. But, but let's look at a couple things just to make sure we don't come to many, any misguided conclusions. Here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to get a clear understanding of what the Bible says the, the purpose of life is. We could get 10 different opinions if I asked. We'd probably get more than that. We're in a Baptist church. We could get 100 different opinions here this morning. If I asked, you just did a poll, what's the purpose of life? We're going to look at God's Word, and it's going to give us a really clear answer to what's the purpose of life. And the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to live out that purpose. Just as an aside real quick, if you, if you ever attend another church, and that's okay if God ever moves you. Some of you, it's more okay than others. But I, I'm just teasing. I love all of you. I really do. I'm just waking you up. This first service, people look at you with a blank stare like, I just had coffee 20 minutes ago. It's not coursing through my veins yet. If you, if you don't get to the point of, of understanding how to do what God's Word does, says to do, it's all, it's all for naught. Here's the first thing it says. It says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. With all your heart, soul, and mind. So let's look at the first word there, love. Now, you probably heard this before, maybe you hadn't, but if you hadn't, it's really, really interesting. Even if you have, it's still interesting, because I've, I've been doing this for 18 years now, or 17 years, I can't really count, but I've studied this over and over and over, and it's refreshing every time I look at this word love. And it's a Greek word, there's three Greek words for love, They're all, we'll all translate them all love, but there's three different ones, uh, eros, phileo, and agape. Eros is, comes where we get our word erotic from, so you can probably get that kind of love. It's more of a physical love. And then there's phileo, and there's a city called Philadelphia. What's that, what's that mean? City of brotherly love. So it's brotherly love. It's the affectionate kind of love you have to a friend. And then there's agape, and that's what this one is, and it's agapeo, agapeo. And it means to esteem or love as an intentional act of a person's will. It, it's a choice type love. It's a choosing love love. It, it is not based in an emotion. It doesn't rise out of an emotion. Phileo does. Eros does. But agape is an act of the, of the will. It is not an act of an emotion. I want you to really differentiate that this morning. This is huge. Because we won't get the purpose of life unless we get this understanding of this single word really, really clear. So it's an act of the will. Have you ever had to choose to like somebody? Choose to be not be fake but to choose to act in somebody else's best interest despite your emotional feelings or leanings towards them. That's what this word talks about. It involves finding your joy in something or someone else. And it differs from phileo, meaning to love uh, 
that indicating feelings of warmth and, and affection. It differs from that because it's a love that is born out of your will, a born, at, born out of your choices. It's a selfless love. It's the, it's the God love. This is God's love defined, okay? But we're told to have the same kind of love. So it's not born out of emotion, but it does result in a great emotion. I tell people this quite frequently, especially myself, that if you choose to love somebody that you don't have feelings for or an affection for, I'm not talking about romantic love, but just to care for somebody, if you choose to do the right thing, feelings follow. If you follow your feelings, you'll oftentimes end up choosing the wrong thing. So you've got to choose the right thing and the right feelings follow. And that's what he's saying here, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And, and, and that's a choice that you make. So there's three other words, and we're not going to dissect them because they're really meant to be taken together when he says heart, soul, and mind. And you can go through and you can analyze each one of those words, and, and it's kind of a neat study. But it's really not the point of what Jesus was trying to communicate. What he was trying to communicate is something, a bigger picture. So let's not get bogged down with each word meaning today, but, but to take that, that triad of words to, to understand that we're to choose to love God with everything we have and all that we are. That's what he's saying when he says heart, soul, and mind. To choose to love God with everything we have and all that we are, nothing held back, we surrender it all and give it all over to him. Okay? They're holding nothing back in our devotion. So we're not going to choose to love God with everything or we are going to choose to love God with everything we have, all that we are, holding nothing back. That's what he's telling us to do. And then there's the second one. Now, I want to transition thoughts. He's not thoughts, but I want to connect these two things like he did. The first and greatest commandment, love God with everything you've got. Choose to love God with everything you've got. That's what he's telling us to do, okay? Don't hold anything back. Then he said a second one is like it. And he's equating the two. In fact, he's making them in the language. He's making them inseparable. You can't do one without the other. One is equal to the other. One comes with the other. They're, the, they're one and the same. You don't separate these two. And Jesus made that clear when he said, one, the second is equal to it, or second is like it. And the second one was, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Same word for love, agapeo. And it means, to, as an act of your will, choose to love your neighbor. And the word for love is the same one. So that's important because we have to be reminded that this love doesn't start with an emotional affection. We have to get that pounded into our brains because nothing else in our society or in our culture tells us that. Most of what you hear and are inundated with is love is a feeling. It's a feeling that comes naturally. It's a feeling that comes when you have like interests or, or, or an emotional or a physical affection for somebody. That's what the world tells you. The, God, the, the Word of God is telling you that, that this love is very, very different. It is a choice that you choose because you know what is right and you choose to do what is right. So this love starts with a choice to deliberately put the needs of other people on the same level as your own needs. Now, when Jesus is teaching this in other places, we are going to see that he talks about putting it on the same level. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay? Because, not in an unhealthy way, but you do need to love yourself. Other, however, if you don't love yourself and you love your neighbor like you love yourself, then that's not very good love, right? If you don't love yourself, then how can you love somebody else? So loving God has this really tangible aspect to it. This is how I understand this, and I believe this is accurate. That what Jesus is doing is saying this. Your ultimate purpose in life is to love God with everything you've got. And here's how you do that. You love other people like you love yourself. So if someone were to say, all right, I understand, how do I love God? I, I, you're telling me I can't do it with my emotions. So I can't, it's not an affectionate thing that I can do. Well, I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying that that's not the first thing that comes. That's not how it all begins. And so how do I do it? And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Loving God has that. We, we can't love God. Let me, let me say it this way. We can't love God and not love the very people who are made in his image. It's impossible. And we try to separate this all the time. You may not want to admit that, but we, we were not good at equating these two things. So here, let's, let me summarize this, and then we'll go into the practicalities of how to do this. This is the purpose of your life. 
Whether you agree with it or not is not the point. Whether you like it or not is not the point. But this is how God defines the purpose of your life and my life today. To love God with all you have and to love others as much as you love yourself. That's why you're on this planet. If you wake up tomorrow and you want to know the meaning of life, there it is. To love God with all you have and to love other people as much as you love yourself. To treat them like you would want to be treated. That's, that's called what? The golden rule, right? Jesus said the golden rule. That's where we got it from. That's the purpose of your life. It's not mysterious, is it? It's not mystical. You don't have to go into some Eastern mystic religion to kind of discover yourself and find the, this mystical meaning. It, it's right here. Your purpose, the reason that you have breath, the reason that God thought of you, created you, and gave you life on this planet is right there. To love him back with everything you've got, and you do that by loving other people. So, so let's, let's go there. How do I do it? How do I carry this out? You're telling me, preacher, that it is not about my emotions. And, and for some of you, that's probably a relief, right? Because you're thinking, I don't always feel emotionally affectionate toward God. I don't even know what he looks like or sounds like. I don't have any way to... Really, I don't feel like I know how to connect with him because all of my other relationships are physical in nature. This one's spiritual in nature. So how do I love God above all else? Very practical answers. Look at what it says. Loving God, I'm going to show you this. Loving God equals this, obeying the teachings of Jesus. That's how you choose to love God. Now, I didn't make that up. It sounds like a preacher answer, but I didn't make it up. Loving God is that simple. Obeying the teachings of Jesus. Here's the, I'm going to give you several verses, but look at this one. In John 14, 15, Jesus said it this simply in New Living Translation. If you love me, obey my commands. That's as simple and straightforward as we can possibly put that. If you love Jesus, obey his commands. Now, write these references down. I don't think I gave them to you in your, in your uh, handout. But John 14, 21 just a little later in that passage, Jesus said this, John 14, 21, He who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Let that sink in. He who has my commands and keeps them, that means to obey them. I think that's interesting that he makes that note. He doesn't just say, He who has my commands is the one who loves me. He says, He who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And then in John 14, 24, just a few verses later, Jesus said, anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. So he's equating disobedience with a lack of love. Notice the lack of talk of any kind of emotional affection in any of these. So he says, anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. John 14, 24. Now, in a chapter later, in John 15, in verse 10, Write John 15, verse 10 down. Here's what Jesus said. When you keep my commandments, you remain in my love. When you keep my commandments, you remain in my love. Now, write the next one down. John, 1 John 2, verses 5 through 6. Here's what it says. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Listen to this. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That's inarguable. Loving God equals obeying the teachings of Jesus. So when we tell you to go love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you think that that's intangible, and how do I do that, and I don't know, very, very practical. Go do what Jesus said to do. Obey his commands and his teachings. You say, well, that's not love. That is love. That's not the world's love. That's agape love. That's a, an act of your will. That's a choice that you make. Because you want to love God, you choose to do these things, and then, and then the feelings follow. I have never had my feelings lead me into right relationship with God. But I have had right relationship with God lead me into the most powerful, emotional times of connection with God that I've ever, ever experienced in my life. Do you understand the, the, the dynamic there? Your emotions will not lead you into truth. Truth will lead you into great and true emotions. So I want you to notice that all those scriptures equate loving God with obeying teachings of Jesus, period. There's no exceptions to that. There's no, there's no ambiguity. Now, Here's the next question, if you're like me, and you may not want to admit that if you are, but if you're like me, here's the next question you would ask. 
all right, there's a lot of teachings. What do I have to do? I have to keep all the teachings of Jesus? I mean, there's a whole New Testament full of that. Jesus knew he'd say that, I'm convinced. And so he made this really simple. What did Jesus teach? Here's what Jesus taught. Treat other people like we would want to be treated. Love them like we would love ourselves. That's what he taught. Now, I don't think I have that on a PowerPoint, do I? Not, yes, I do. In the heart of Jesus' teachings, right there. Okay? Now I'm going to read you some scriptures. I want you to note these. Because here's, here's the whole thing. The heart of Jesus' teaching was to treat other people like we want to be treated. That's the heart of it. That's, that's the essence of it. So Jesus said it, Matthew 7, 12. He said, in everything, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. How much clearer can we get than that? And then in, in John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, a new commandment, listen to this one, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's John 13, 34. And in 1 John 4, 20 through 21, listen to how powerfully he says this. This is John speaking. And he says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Do you see now where he, how he's saying, all right, how you love God is by loving people who are made in his image. He knew that you could not love somebody that, that you couldn't tangibly touch, feel. That love has to, has to have an object. And so he gave us an object. He says, I am in, I, these people are created in my image. And so he says, if you don't love God, you say, or if you say you love God, but you don't love your brother, you're a liar. That's what John said. And then he says, in this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So what did Jesus teach? To treat people like you want to be treated. How do we love God? Obey the teachings of Jesus. What are the teachings of Jesus? To treat other people like you want to be treated. So when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment ever given by God was, Jesus said it was to love God with everything you've got and to love other people as ourselves. That's the purpose of life. That is why you're on this planet. This is the tenth difference that Jesus makes in a person's life. We are finishing that series today. But this is huge. This is where all the other differences kind of collide and, and, and come together to make a difference that is above all differences in your life. If you don't know why you're here on this earth, you will never get to line out in a relationship with God. If you don't know your purpose, if you don't know why God has put you on here and given you breath to breathe and life to live, then we are going to miss the ultimate purpose of life altogether and we'll flounder. So here's the life challenge. Here's what we do about this. Since the purpose of your life is to love God with everything you've got, and since the greatest way to love God is by obeying the teachings of Jesus, and since the heart of Jesus' teaching is to treat others like you want to be treated, then let's do one of two things or maybe both of them. Okay? Because then we're challenged to do one of two of these. We need to put this into action this week. Here's the first one. I want to challenge you to reconcile any broken relationships with people in your life before next Sunday. I, which ones? All of them. If you have a broken relationship with a sibling or a parent or a friend or anybody, and you're saying, listen to me now, right? This is so, so, if you're going to get the teaching of, of this morning and what this is all about, this is where the rubber meets the road. If you are here today saying, I love you, God, yet you are living in a broken relationship with somebody in your life. I'm not talking about somebody at school that just doesn't like you too much. I'm not talking about that. Do you have a broken, a fractured relationship with somebody who once you had a good relationship with? If you have that today and you're saying you're loving God today, the Bible, John says it, not me. I'll, I'll blame him. He says you're a liar. You're not loving God. So the first thing we need to do, and you'll, I'll, we'll give you some scriptures, the first thing you need to do is go reconcile that relationship. So, so if these aren't in your listening guide, write them down. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Matthew 18, 20 through 22. Are these in your listening guides? Great, I don't have to say them all. Write the, read those. Okay? Read those. 
You can't love God and live in a broken relationship with another person who's created in his image that you're supposed to have a right relationship with. Why? Because God said to love me, you've got to obey the teachings of Jesus. What are the teachings of Jesus? Treat other people like you would want to be treated. You want somebody to hold a grudge against you? Do you? Do you want that? Do you want them to stay in a broken... Heavens, no, of course not. So your challenge today is to not just... I'm not talking about saying, well, you know, I had a fight with my third grade friend. I've got to find them someday. I'm talking about if you have right now an ongoing tiff, a, a, a grudge match, a, a, something of resentment, a broken friendship or relationship with somebody that is not right, you need to go and make that right. In fact, the Bible says Jesus teaches you can't come back to work. You should not come back to worship until you reconcile that relationship. You'll see that in those scriptures if you read them. Here's the second challenge. I want you to find one person. If, if there is one person in here, and I think this is highly unlikely, but if there's one person in here that says, I'm right with the world. I don't have anybody that has a grudge against me, and I don't have a grudge against anybody. There may be a couple of you here. So what do you want me to do, preacher? I want you to be intentional today, and I want you to think of somebody that you can find in your life that you can intentionally do something for that you would love for someone to do for you. I want you to find something, somebody, that's in your life that you can intentionally do something for this week that you would love for somebody to do for you. And here's the catch. I don't want you to do this as some kind of manipulative effort to get somebody to do something for you. So one of the greatest ways you can do this is anonymously. I don't know if you can do what you want to do anonymously. Maybe you need to send an encouraging note. Maybe you need to, to, you know, buy them dinner out. I don't know what you need to do. But whatever you would love done for you, maybe you do this for your spouse. Maybe you do it for your parents. Maybe you do it for your child or your neighbor, even better yet. This would be great if you did this for an unbelieving neighbor or coworker. Just do something for them that you would love done for you. That's how you figure out what it would be. And if it is with an unbeliever, I want to challenge you to tell them why you're doing it. Say, my preacher told us this week that if that here's the purpose of life, and here's how we live out the purpose of life, and that Jesus' teaching was to treat other people like we would want to be treated, so I, I just want to bless you. In Jesus' name, no expectation of return. I don't want you to do anything in return for me. That's, that'd steal everything out. I'm not doing it for that reason. I just want to be obedient to Jesus. Could you do that? Wouldn't that be amazing? What if 80 or 90 people are in this room? What if you all did that this week? If you went to work, you went back home, you went to your neighborhoods, and you just did stuff for people that you would love for people to do for you, what an incredible witness would just ripple out across our community. And people would begin to ask questions. Just in one week, people would begin to ask questions all over Topeka about Christianity. It would be amazing. It's not hard. The purpose of your life is to love Jesus with all you've got. Everything you've got, hold him nothing back. How do you do that? You obey his teaching. What's his teaching? To love people like you'd like to be loved yourself and like you love yourself. It's simple. It's straightforward. It's life-changing. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Lord, I need things to be simple. And you know that, and I thank you that they are. This is so clear. It's so straightforward. There's no ambiguity. We just have to look in your word, and there it is. It just leaps off the page. And, and God, there are people today that are going to end their lives because they don't know the purpose of their life. There are going to be people in our city who are, who are considering suicide this very day because they don't understand why they're on this planet. And there are 80 or 90 people in this room that have not that excuse they don't have any reason to not be joyful, to be filled with incredible enthusiasm for life because we know why we're here. It's not to have a big fancy house or, or lots of money or a great retirement account or to be famous or powerful. It is to love you with everything we've got. And God, thank you for making that so clear on how to do that. We just get to obey Jesus. Jesus, thank you for making your teachings all boil down to one truth that we should treat people like we want to be treated. Help us to do that. Help us to be an army of ambassadors to live like Jesus this week. May people fearlessly reconcile relationships that are broken and selflessly give to others in the name of Jesus. 
Father, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you.